I'd love to start with a survey and ask who here in the audience has done some of the things Matt was describing. Perhaps first, uh, who here has done a diet recently or participated in a workout regimen to try to get a little bit healthier? How about collected your health data with something like an Aura or a Whoop? And what about taking a longevity-related supplement before? Okay, a few hands, so good, a good crowd <laughs> what of What about a uh, DEXA scan? Who's done a DEXA scan? All right, you guys, are, you guys get, get a, <laughs> at least a B plus. That's good. That, I, that's one thing I would suggest. Body composition is something a lot of people don't pay much attention to. It's, it's super important. That's one of those sort of diagnostics that I was talking about that can be really, um, really useful to help you know where you're at and get on a, a better trajectory. Mm -hmm. I'd love to start this uh, Q&A where you started your talk, Matt, alluding to the fact that we have a lot of people in the room here today trying to perform at the highest level and also thinking about their longevity for, for the remainder of their life, and wanted to ask you how you think about the tension or the complement between performance and longevity. Where is performance the same as optimizing for longevity, and where is there a trade-off that, that we ought to be cognizant of? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's pretty clear that, that, that performance and longevity are, are overlapping, but distinct, and so certainly, especially as you get older, right, uh, optimizing your performance, one of the ways to do that is to optimize your longevity, your health span, your, your biological rate of aging. Because as we know, in many domains, not all, in many domains, performance goes down with age. But it's certainly also the case that, again, it depends a little bit on how you define performance, right? But if you're looking purely at how long can I work, how much can I get done in terms of work, there is for many people, a point where that becomes counterproductive for your overall health, your overall um, longevity. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but you know, obviously stress, and we know a lot about the biology now, for example, directly impacts the biology of aging and in many ways can accelerate your rate of biological aging. So you may be paying the price later for what you're doing now to optimize your performance if you're not taking a more holistic view of your, your overall health. That makes great sense. One of the things you've talked a lot about publicly before is risk versus reward, and about how we probably don't make the correct estimation of risk and reward. Can you tell us your philosophy on how you think about that? Sure. So, so, and this is sort of related to what we were just talking about. I think very few people, and it's hard, but very few, few people think about sort of the long-term consequences of, number one, what you're doing now, and number two, and probably more relevant, what you're not doing. So the specific context where I have spent some time thinking about risk reward is in the context of aging and the risk that goes along with doing nothing. So we know that there are we know there are things we can do now that work. Again, we'll go back to lifestyle. Those are the gold standard. We know those things work. We know there are some things where they might work. And I think we may talk about some of these, yeah. but like supplements we talked about. There are some things that might work and those have probabilistic components to them. How likely is it that they'll work? How likely is it that, that, that they won't work? And what are the risks? And again, particularly with FDA, I think this is a really good example. FDA, I'm sure many people in this room are not fans of FDA, but FDA you know, doesn't take this view. When they're thinking about a medication, they are not thinking about, especially in the context of, of a non-diseased person, what are the consequences if we don't do anything? If you wanted to do a clinical trial for a drug to modify the biology of aging, improve health span, prevent disease, right? That's really hard because FDA does not take the view of, what are the consequences of not doing anything? They don't weigh that risk. And I think we need to have a conversation about that and people more broadly should think about what's the risk of not doing anything when you're weighing the risk of doing something, whether that's taking a medication, taking a supplement or anything else. So that's mostly the context. So then let's talk about some of the things that we might do. Last year at Founder Summit, we had a session with Laura Deming and as soon as we opened it up for questions, all of the questions were about what supplements we should be taking and about whether or not the risk was proportional. Yeah, this to the is report. not medical advice, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to preempt some of those and do a lightning round where I propose to you an intervention and you can share, perhaps on a scale of one to five, how you think about the risk and, and the reward. And maybe let's start with rapamycin, something that I know you're a fan of. Okay. So yeah, so, so this is great. First thing I, I want to just give a one disclaimer. I know I'm supposed Please. to keep this short, but, uh, <laughs> but I mean, again, I think it's important to recognize nothing, none of this is proven, right? I'm sure you guys get that, but there's all, people just always want to have certainty. And when we're talking about things that might affect longevity and health span, we don't have a lot in humans because these things haven't been tested, right? So it's just important to, to recognize all of this comes with a degree of 
you know, uncertainty. So rapamycin, I think in the likelihood that it will benefit a lot of people, I would give it a four. And in the risk, and again, this is where other people will disagree with me, this is Matt's opinion, I actually think rapamycin is way lower risk than most people appreciate. So I'd say it's probably a, a two in the, in the risk category. How about metformin? Uh, if you're diabetic, a five. If you're non-diabetic, a two. In terms of likelihood of working, the risk is also pretty low, probably a two. Although actually rep metformin, most people probably don't know this, is probably has some side effects that are more problematic than rapamycin. Like in many men, metformin reduces testosterone. For those of you who care about testosterone, you might want to <laughs> know that. Uh, how about NAD plus precursors like NMN or NR? I know yeah, so I think those. the population where those are likely to be beneficial for people uh, is much smaller than certainly rapamycin and metformin. Across the population, the likelihood of benefit is maybe a two or a three, and the risk is probably a, a one or a two. Although I will say this may change. So for those of you who know about NAD precursors, if any of you are taking nicotinamide mononucleotide, there's an unpublished paper, it should come out in the next few months, hopefully. Uh, this is in mice. And again, I should have said that too. I'm going off of data for longevity and health span in mice because that's what we've got. In mice, in aged mice, nicotinamide mononucleotide, maybe also nicotinamide riboside, preferentially causes kidney damage. And the mechanism is well understood. So if any of you are taking those, if you're young, probably not a problem. If you're older, we don't know if it's a problem, but, but, and I think this is a general, sorry, I know I'm going on again, oh, but please. this is a really important thing for people to appreciate. When it comes to supplements, FDA will pull a supplement if they learn that it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Just because it's available on the open market does not mean it's safe. So it's really something a lot of people don't appreciate, but it's useful to know that. Just because you can buy it over the counter doesn't mean it's safe. Mm -hmm. So now that we've preempted some of the supplement questions, I have a, a couple uh, interventions, behavioral interventions, perhaps for starting with exercise. You had some interesting thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, my view is, uh, Maintaining function late in life is really, really important. So exercise overall, good, okay, in general. Sure, you can push it too far. In general, very few people are pushing it too far. And exercise overall is probably the, uh, that and a, and, and a healthy diet are the two most important things you can do, sleep being close. Uh, but I tend to, to say, you know, for, this is broadly speaking, resistance training or other forms of exercise that build and maintain lean mass are typically underappreciated versus you know, cardiovascular training. And the, my reason for saying that is that as we get older, uh, frailty, sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass is one of the leading causes of injury uh, and ultimately mortality, and it's underappreciated. So if I had to put them in buckets, I would emphasize resistance training, maintaining lean mass, building lean mass when you're younger over cardio training. Obviously, you want both. This gets back to why I mentioned DEXA specifically, because DEXA will tell you your bone mineral density, your lean mass, your fat mass. Um, resistance training also helps maintain and build bone density as well, which obviously is important as we get older. And finally, a number of us were at the cold plunge this morning, yeah. and I know enjoyed a competition to see who could stay in the longest. Perhaps you can tell us your Not thoughts my on, thing. <laughs> on ice baths. So again, I, I would put cold plunges. There's a bunch of stuff that's in the maybe bucket, right? Where, you know, is it good for you? I don't know. I mean, in terms of like your long-term health span, if, if, it, if it makes you feel good, if it feels like you relieve stress, if it energizes you, it's not probably not going to harm you unless you stay in too long. But I wouldn't put it in the sort of, you know, gold standard class of, you know, some of these other things where we've got pretty good reason to believe that they're going to be net beneficial in the long run. Now that we've talked about a couple of the potential interventions, I'd love to ask you how you would uh, like for us to think about a process for evaluating this sort of stuff moving forward. And obviously you spend all of your time focused in the literature here and have a, a great uh, ability to discern what is true and what is not, but for someone who is interested and competent but not coming from a scientific background, what, what should the process be that we think about when trying to evaluate uh, an intervention for longevity? Yeah, so, so for interventions in, in particular, um, it's really hard. Again, this gets back to what I was saying before, that there's a bunch of noise out there. So I think the, the, the way Again, the way I would approach it is I'd go right to the primary literature and try to evaluate it for myself. I recognize that's not realistic for people who, who aren't deep in this space. So I, again, I would try to identify credible voices and figure out what they think, but that's hard too. So, you know, for me personally, let's say I, let's say I didn't have the background that I have. I would probably, honestly, I mean, it sounds kind of silly, I would probably say, well, what does Peter think about it, right? Again, I mentioned Peter Atiyah. I think he's very credible. I think, you know, while I don't agree with everything that he says, 
he's very, he researches it. He's not trying to, he doesn't have an, a financial stake in selling these things. I would also be very skeptical. And so I would, I would try to look and see, you know, in the long term, so think about this. If somebody says this intervention is gonna increase your longevity, what's the rationale for that? And this is where it's important to separate increasing longevity from health benefits. Mm -hmm. Not everything that might have health benefits is gonna increase longevity, right? But if somebody's claiming that this supplement uh, slows aging and increases longevity, what's the evidence? Does it come from human studies? No, almost certainly not, because we don't have any clinical trials for longevity in humans. So it comes from human studies, it comes from epidemiology, and, and how good is that data? Sometimes it's better than others. How long has this been studied? If we don't have 10-year epidemiological studies in people, you should think about what might the risks be? How safe do we know this, this to be? And then you can be guided by the laboratory studies. Does it increase lifespan and health span in mice? That experiment should have been done if there's any real evidence that this targets the biology of aging. That's a good place to start. So I, I wish I had an easy answer for you, but you could ask me, but please don't. Please don't email me with you. Well, <laughs> if anyone has questions, now is the perfect time to ask them. We'll take a couple of questions on the biology of aging. Benedict. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Very interesting. What I'm wondering is, you know, sort of how this plays in with human psychology. The problem is that I think a lot of times I see people, you know, even if they, you know, read research papers or they, they hear you and, and yeah. give advice on some supplement. So they're then thinking, okay, I got to take this supplement. And even if we knew that it would help, the problem is they're ignoring the lifestyle change, yeah. which is just like, why aren't we just telling people like, move, what was it? Like move, eat, move, eat sleep, well, connect. sleep yeah. and socialize. Which is like, is 90, like there we actually know that it helps. And then, you know, some, sorry, stupid supplement, like, yeah. which might help. And if you're doing all of these things, then maybe you should also do that. It just seems so ridiculous how much people and like bro science is focusing <laughs> on, you know, some, yeah, some like 0.1%. Yeah. Well, we know the thing that really helps is just do sports and like eat well. Yeah, you get it. So, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't have the answer to your question. You're right. Uh, so supplements are supplements, right? You need to get the foundation in place before those are really going to move the needle. The one exception I would say is, and this is my view on supplements, you should supplement to deficiencies. And this is where the diagnostics, getting a comprehensive blood panel done. If you're deficient in vitamin D, you should supplement. If you're deficient in omega-3, you should supplement, okay? But I, you're right, beyond that, you got to get the foundation in place. Look, humans are funny animals, right? How do we actually get people to do that? That's hard. I think there are some tools that can help. I don't know, how many, how many of you have done continuous glucose monitoring? I think that's a really sticky tool. And it doesn't work for everyone, but I think for behavior modification, it's a really sticky tool. I've, I've got one on and I don't do it all the time, but I do it you know, once every few months. I learn something every time. And the first time I did it, what I learned is bagels are really bad for me, right? So I don't eat bagels anymore. So that, it, that can be sort of a behavior modifying sort of tool. And I think there are some others out there that are, that are like that. But I don't have the answers to, to how, you, how you modify human behavior other than to say, look, it's super, it's super hard. And there are, this is where I think the um, you know, inequities really come into play, right? Because there are cer certainly many people who don't have, who don't have access to some of the things that they need to op optimize their lifestyle. So it's, it's hard. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, but you're right. Hey, I'm really curious how you think about um, the whole A-B testing, quantified self way of trying to optimize your health span, lifespan. Yeah. Like, for instance, Gwen with his blog, he did a lot of that. Or Brian Johnson is now taking off quite a bit. Yeah. So, so I, I have mixed feelings. I think that monitoring, and obviously I fall into this camp. I'm wearing a CGM, right? I do a lot of this sort of data collection. Mm -hmm. um, I think that collecting data and evaluating biomarkers and trying to, to push your biomarkers in the direction we believe is closer to optimal health, better health, makes sense. That's what we should be doing. I think the challenge is that there are a lot of people who um, don't have the background or uh, information quite right, and they're not willing to do the work, and so they start using biomarkers that don't make a ton of sense, or come up with these super complicated, you know, protocols that it really probably only need to do 20% of what they're doing to get 80 or 90% of the benefit. So I think the challenge is, again, this gets back to the credibility. A lot of the people in that space are not particularly knowledgeable or credible, but I think that approach makes a ton of sense. 
And with that, please join me in thanking Matt for being with us today. Thank you.